Thank you, choir, and all of you who have led us this morning. The, the book of Esther is one of the great stories of the Old Testament. It's full of intrigue. It's full of common humanity. It's, it's full of moral dilemma. The story begins with a moral dilemma that's, that's rather, um, it's rather unusual. And here's the beginning memorial, the introductory moral dilemma. What do you do if you're the husband of a wife who is strong-willed? What do you do if your wife has a, has a mind of her own and a sense of self-respect beyond your opinion? The story begins with King Azurius of Persia holding a great seven-day-long banquet. And the scripture, the narrator tells us in the story that they had drank flagons and flagons of wine out of golden goblets for seven days. And the king has said, by the king's order, every man should act and do as he chooses in his state. And then he orders his wife to come to the party. Seven days of uncontrolled drinking. And he orders Queen Vashti to come to the party because she is so beautiful he wants everyone to see her. Queen Vashti, on the other hand, has been having a party for the women of the kingdom. They've been drinking Earl Grey tea and eating little square cakes and fancy cookies. And she comes to the door of the king's party and she sees it is an out of control fraternity mess. And she refuses to go in. She says, I'm not going in. And she turns around and she goes back to her room. And King Azurius doesn't know what to do. He brings the seven most wise men of the Medes and the Persians together. And he says, what do you do with a wife who disobeys you? What do you do with a wife who won't come in? And they put their seven smart heads together. And they said, King, if you let her get away from this, every husband in the country is going to have trouble. If you let her get away with this, every wife in the kingdom will disrespect their husbands. So the king ordered that King Vashti be stripped of her crown and banished from his presence, and she never saw the king again. Well, now the king is single. This is where Esther comes in. It's the very first season of The Bachelor. They... <laughs> They go to the 12 kingdom, the 12 sections within the kingdom of Persia, and they elect that each one of the sections is to send a representative woman who will try out for the kings to be the queen. And by I try, mean try out, I mean they bring them in, they give them a pure, full perfumer's makeover, they get six months of mirror of uh, mirror treatment they get six months of spa treatment they get their own personal tailors and then they are brought in for the king to a personal tribute and tryout and this is a family hour and we're not going to discuss the tryout but esther comes into the one of the 12 and she rises to the top among all the other tryouts to be the queen and she happens to be the niece of Mordecai, the leading Jew in the nation of Persia who sits at the gate among the wise men. And Mordecai tells her, the Lord is putting you here for a purpose. And Asurias chooses her to be queen, and she sits on the throne. And it pays off very quickly for the king. As Mordecai is sitting in the gate, he overhears of an assassination plot against the king. He alerts Esther. Esther tells the king, and the plot is foiled, and the traitors are executed. Very short order, choosing Esther to be the queen also saves the king's life. In the meantime, the king has appointed a COO, chief operations officer, named Haman. And Haman's going to run around and do the hard work of the kingdom. He's going to make sure the grain elevators are full. He's going to make sure there was water in the cisterns. He's going to make sure the potholes are filled in. He's going to run the kingdom while the king goes around cutting ribbons and shaking hands and kissing babies. Haman has incredible power. And one day he's following along through the city of Susa 
as the king is marched through and he notices everybody in the street bows down when the king passes except for one guy, Mordecai, Esther's uncle, stands up straight while everyone else is bowing down. So Mordecai gets out his smart, I mean, uh, Haman gets out his smartphone and he texts another guy at the gate and he says, hey, how come Mordecai doesn't kneel down when the king passes by? And the guy answers back. He said, well, Mordecai is a Jew. He only bows down to Yahweh. He does not bow down to any other man. That makes Haman furious with a slow burn. He sees himself now as standing alongside the king. After all, the king's just ceremony. I'm the one feeding the people. And when the king walks by, they ought to bow down. And when, when I'm close to the king, they ought to bow down. And Mordecai begins to burn with this anger that this Jew does not, does not bow down when the king passes by. And so, the, so he goes to the king and he says to him, he says, King, I want to ask you to pass a decree. I want to pass a decree that on the 13th day of Adar, which is around the 13th of March, on the 13th day of, the, of Adar, I want to pass an edict that all of the Jews be executed throughout the Persian Empire. In every section, in every region, on the 13th day of Adar, all the Jews be rounded up and they be executed. And the king says, why do you want to do that? He said, well, they are disrespectful to the laws of our kingdom. The king takes off his ring, hands it to Haman and says, make the decree and seal it with my stamp. Now, also in the deal, Haman has promised that if you allow me to make this decree, I'll give you 10,000 talents of silver. That's, that's 60,000 pounds of silver. I punched that in on the spot market Tuesday, and 60,000 pounds of silver comes in between 13 million and 14 million dollars in silver in today's money. Now, if you're the king, you're going to ask yourself, where is Haman, my employee, who works only for me, getting $13 million worth of silver to give to me? But then again, you are smarter than the king. Because the king just takes the gift and the offering, 10,000 talents of silver. Sure, here's my ring. Make the decree. What you learn throughout this story is that... Uh, the king is not the shiniest penny in the pocket. He is a brick shy of a load, if you will. I mean, after all, if any reasonable man would ask his wife to come into a party full of drunken men so he can show off her beauty, where he has said, you may act as you want. Any man who puts his wife in that position, who has any sense at all, is going to go home, drink a lot of coffee, take a shower, shave his face, put on some cologne, change his clothes, and knock on the door to her room and say, Honey, I am a fool. I am so sorry. I lost my head in my condition. Honey, you are too grand and you are too great, and I apologize for putting you in that position. That's not what Sirius does. Sirius gets his guys together and they say, well, if you let this stand, all the women in the country are going to rebel. He's not the sharpest guy around. So he issues a decree without thinking about it and without wondering if my own employee is robbing me of $13 million worth of silver. So the decree goes out. That on the 13th day of Adar, all the Jews in the kingdom of Persia are going to be rounded up and they're going to be executed. Mordecai hears about it. He begins to cry. He tears his clothes. He puts on sackcloth and ashes and he repents in the city gate. Esther's in her room in the palace and she hears all the cries and the wailing and the moaning and the groaning coming from the city and she sends her messenger, find out what's going on. And they came back to her and they told her that Haman has issued a decree that all the Jews would be executed. Esther calls for Mordecai to come to the palace. She says, is this true? He said, it is true. And he said, Esther, if they kill us, 
They're coming after you. And then he says the most famous words that we find in the book of Esther. In the fourth chapter, he says to her, The Lord has put you here for such a time as this. The Lord has put you in this place at this moment in time to save your people. Now, Esther doesn't have to reveal that she's a Jew. She's a queen. She's got protection. She's been crowned and anointed. But she tells Haman, I mean, tells Mordecai, you go and tell the people to repent and to fast for three days. No food, no water for three days. And I will repent and I will fast for three days. And then I will tell the king. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai leaves from her presence and they go to fast. And she begins her fast. For such a time as this. In our lives, there are moments where we stand where Esther stood. Moments when we have to make a decision. Moments when we have to take leadership. Moments when we have to do the hard thing. Moments when we have to be ready. In my newsletter article this week, I used the University of Oklahoma football team as an example of this. Last Saturday night, OU played the cadets of West Point, the Black Knights of Army. And Army came in with a game plan that they were going to run the ball and they were going to hold the ball as long as they could between plays, and they were going to control the clock. And they did. 44 minutes of the clock, the Army controlled, while Oklahoma only had a little over 15 minutes of time to play with their offense. Oklahoma only ran 40 plays the whole game. Army ran the ball, make a few yards, run the clock. Run the ball, make a few yards, run the clock. And all the while, the superstars, the paid players of the University of Oklahoma by Bob Graves' bank account. <laughs> he knew I couldn't tell a story without getting that in there. <laughs> Stood on the sidelines holding their helmets. Now, not only is this strategy to control the clock, the strategy is to frustrate the offense of the University of Oklahoma. Because when you get the ball, you've got to do something with it. And then usually when you're pressing, when you're frustrated and you try to do something with it, you run before you catch the ball. Or you try to make the handoff too quickly. Or you overthrow trying to make too much of a pass. And you make mistakes. But last Friday, last Saturday night, the University of Oklahoma, in the little bit of time they had, rose to the challenge and made the plays and scored the points just enough to win the game. Now, I am one who believes sports are a metaphor for life and our playing sports are a metaphor for life. That our children learn lessons through playing sports that are difficult to learn in other ways. They learn about teamwork. They learn about fortitude. They learn lessons about themselves. And last Saturday night's game for the players of Oklahoma, whether they ever go play pro ball or not, whether they become stockbrokers or farmers or bankers or teachers or coaches or whatever they become, they learned the lesson about doing the right thing at the right time. And they were ready to execute at just the right moment. That's where Esther is. She's there at just the right moment. And so she calls to the king. And she tells the king, I want to have a banquet for just you and Haman. Both of you come. Come to the banquet with me. And so they, they prepare everything and they get ready for the banquet. And the night before, the king can't sleep. So he calls for one of his court clerks to come in and read the court records to him, hoping it'll kind of make him sleepy a little bit. And, and they start reading the court records, and he reads about Mordecai reporting the two traitors and that the traitors were executed for their 
for their treason. And the king stopped them right there and he said, did we, did we ever do anything to honor Mordecai? And the, the, and the court clerk said, no, we didn't, we didn't ever order Mordecai, honor him. Well, let's do that tomorrow morning. So the next morning, the king calls Mordecai in, puts him in fine royal robes, puts a fine royal hat on his head, puts him on one of the royal steeds, and leads him through the town of Susa for all the people to bow down to Mordecai for his act of bravery in reporting the traitors. Now, that's, this is the guy that Haman wants to kill. As a matter of fact, Haman has had a gallows built to execute Mordecai that are 50 cubits high. And the king is parading him through the streets as a man of honor. The morning of the banquet. When they get to the banquet, Haman is in a foul mood. He is angry with the Jews. He is frustrated with Mordecai. He is frustrated that a king would honor Mordecai. And they sit down at the table and Esther says to the king, she says, there's an edict out that I and my people will be murdered on the 13th day of Adar. And the king says, there is? Now remember, I told you, the elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. The king says, there is an edict? And she said, yes, there's an edict that I and my people will all be executed on the 13th day of Adar. And the king said, did you know anything about this, Haman? And Haman tried to play dumb, and he said, yes. I knew about it. And the king was furious. The king storms out of the room, and he goes out into the garden, and he paces around a bit. And meanwhile, Haman stays in the room with Queen Esther, and he throws himself on the couch where she is reclining, and he is begging, please, 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 please. Save me from the king's wrath. And when the king comes back in, he sees Haman laying on the couch, reaching for the queen, thinking that he's trying to make a sexual advance toward the queen instead of begging for his life. The king orders Haman to be executed, and one of the servants says, well, he just built some gallows for Mordecai today. Let's hang him on his own gallows. And the king ordered it so, and they went out and they hung Haman on the old gallows, and the people were saved. That is why in the Jewish tradition, on the 14th day of March, they honor the, the festival of Purim, where they come together and they eat, and they celebrate, and they exchange gifts, and they thank the Lord for Esther and saving their people for such a time as this. All of us. All of us have those moments in our lives when we have to stand up. We may have to stand up to a bully and say, no, in the name of all that is righteous, no, you will not harm the innocent. We may have to stand up against lies and false truths. We may have to stand up when it is possibly dangerous and say, no, we're going to stand up in the name of Jesus Christ against all things. I think one of those times may have come to us this weekend. It's a tragedy. Michael's loss on early Friday evening. A wife, four children, the loss of support and the loss of employment and all the questions that hang over the future. And it's up to us as a church family. It's up to us as a church family to stand beside them and be the love of Christ in every physical way that we can be. It's up to us to be the people who show up after the memorial service and offer the encouragement. It's up to us to encourage his children. For such a time as this, We've been placed here with this responsibility. I've been reading Doris Kearns Goodwin's new book on leadership. She goes through the early life of all about five of our presidents. 
she comes to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and she describes his childhood in that his father became ill, and his outdoor life became kind of restricted in a way, and he became more of an inside person, and he began these collections. He collected insects, and he collected uh, different kinds of coins, but he really got fascinated with stamps. And he started collecting the stamps. And then when he got to be early high school, late junior high age, they were in a conversation with some people. And he began to talk about this country, this, and this geography in this country, and this country has these policies in this country. And he had a wealth of knowledge about the countries around the world that was beyond his sister's understanding. So he asked her, or she asked him, she said, how do you know so much about these countries? And he said, well, whenever I find a stamp I like from a, that's issued by a country somewhere, then I study everything I can study about the country that issued that stamp. And he said, I've just gotten absorbed with reading about these countries, and I read everything I can read. Doris Kearns Goodwin says that when Roosevelt became president in World War II, he had as much knowledge about all the geopolitical implications and the geography of the war of anybody who walked into the Oval Office. She said, it seems like an odd thing to read about every company that entered, issued the stamps. But in reality, when he was president of the United States in World War II, he was ready. He had a knowledge nobody else had for such a time as this. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, all of us have roads and intersections in our lives. We have moments when we have to make a choice if we're going to step up or step down. We have events, Father, that push us into action or cause us to run away. Father, I pray that in the, the course of our lives that the lessons that we learn would prepare us for the moments when you need us. Lord, help us to look at the life and example of Esther and Mordecai and be ready to serve in the hard moments when it's our time. Well, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is today's water friend we have in Jesus. We invite you to come forward this morning proclaiming faith in Jesus Christ, joining our church and fellowship and ministry together. If you'd like to pray, I'll be here this morning. But let's stand. Let's sing together and you come as the Spirit leads. <laughs>